We have heard about how you have declared us not guilty. Even better, you have no charge against us. We would ask, therefore, that we would begin to see what this means for how I live today. What am I going to do uh, in Bible study, in church, after church? How does this impact the way I view my, my job and, and my family? Help me to see that I am a new creation, and because I am a new creation, and I do have the Holy Spirit in my heart, that I am able to defeat all, all temptation. This is the promise that you have made to us. Lord, you have not called us to failure, and so will you tell us that we are no longer slaves to sin. You are not lying to us. We would ask that you would give us the strength now to go and fulfill uh, the promises that we have made to you to live that new life, but not in a way that is servile, but rather in the great joy of knowing that, that we are holy in your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take a look at Romans chapter 6. We begin with verse 1. Uh, I'll read a little section of this. Follow along now for the next couple of uh, uh, weeks, we'll be dealing essentially in the book of Romans. So if you do have a personal Bible, if you bring it, if you do not, uh, back there, there are some Bibles for you. Um, I, I, the one good thing about having a personal Bible is, uh, is that you can write in it. Uh, it's, it's a good habit to, um, to write in your Bible. If you want to take one of those Bibles and, and just make it your own and write in it, you go ahead. Uh, we'll just order more. All right, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead uh, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Uh, a couple of, of things here. First of all, uh, what does Paul mean by asking, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Anybody, we, we introduced that yesterday. What, what's his point? That yep, that we're forgiven. We are forgiven. Grace increases. What will bring about more grace in your life? Tom? More sin. More sin. You know, you want to have a lot of grace in your life, you just sin more. The more you sin, the more grace you get. Uh, that was the thing that Luther was accused of. That's the thing that Lutherans generally can be accused of. Uh, I, I have heard it uh, when I taught high school, uh, especially from a certain group, and I'm going to leave this out because uh, it's not beneficial for you to know who it would be. But they said, you know... All is just, you're just forgiven. No wonder people go out and, and drink and smoke and, and party. Because all you're telling them is, oh, you're going to be forgiven. See, St. Paul already anticipates that. You'd think the Jews, remember the Jews have 600 and I think 23 separate, 623 or 621 different commandments. We talked about the cheeseburger. Can't have a cheeseburger. Very legalistic. You do this. God's going to love you. Now you have St. Paul saying, you're forgiven everything. Then people are going like, Paul, this is a bad business model. This is a bad business model because people are just going to sin more because they're going to get more grace. Uh, just so you know that, that word go on sinning, that's present tense. This is why that's important. Uh, Anytime you have that present, it means practice of sin as habit. Present tense means it's just going on, okay? This isn't like, okay, one time when I was 17, I did this, and then I never did it again. This is, shall I go on sinning? In other words, I am sinning the same sin every single day. I'm not really trying to, to, to fight, off, fight it off. Uh, Vicar Paustian is going to talk to us about that next week in his sermon. Uh, the difference between a sin of weakness. I've already got a sneak peek at his sermon. Uh, Vicar Paustian and I spend a lot of quality time together. And we discuss sermons a lot, don't we? Yes, and it's both, it's mutually beneficial. Just nod your head. Mutually beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, here's one of those things. 
Is sin your habit? That's what he's talking about. Not a generic thing. Not like, okay, I am sinful, I'm struggling, oh, I'm fighting. I mean, this is, this is just what you do. This is who you are. This is how you live. This is, this is my identity. I do this. That's what he's talking about. Uh, and then the, the charge is uh, antinomian. And you see that circling around sometimes on the, the, the internet. Uh, I, I was reading a, a blog about, mm, I think it was like around on Thursday, and that was the term that was used, that we are, that Lutherans, conservative Lutherans are antinomian. Uh, and that is that we are anti against the law. In other words, what we've said is the law has no value. You don't have to follow the law because you're going to be forgiven anyway. That's the charge uh, for St. Paul. It's also a charge that lurks around here. Uh, I, I do think that there is a tendency in some groups to have uh, to, to be purely antinomian, that there's, there's just nothing wrong. I mean, I, I think you can... I will give you an example, probably a good... A uh, good one would be the Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, there's not a lot of them, but you, you can be whatever you want to, Unitarian. If, if you want to be a Unitarian and you want to be very conservative, it's going to be tough, but you can do it. You want to be a Unitarian Universalist and a Buddhist, well, yeah, you go ahead. If you want to be uh, uh, pro-choice and uh, pro uh, IV drug use, Unitarian Universalist Church, that's the one for you. Uh, I, I had to do a project where I had to critique sermons, and so I downloaded 10 sermons from the Unitarian Universalist Church in Appleton. The only thing you can do wrong is be mean. Th that's it. As long as you're nice, once, you're, once you do that, everything else is off the table. That's antinomian. I'll tell you why that's so dangerous. Any church that is antinomian, in other words, there's no law, is also anti-gospel. You have to have the law. If there's no law, if there's no right and there's no wrong, why do you need Jesus Christ? Um, a professor of mine uh, years ago at the seminary said that when you preach the law, there should be a certain portion of your congregation that wants to get up and leave church because that's what the law does. What is the law? I have a problem and my problem is so big I can't fix my problem. I, gotta, I am so disgusting inside, I am so twisted and perverted inside, and no amount of me trying to, to get myself out of it is ever going to change it. What, what did the, the tax collector say? Dear God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the problem. If there is no law, then there's no need for the gospel. And then essentially what uh, churches become is country clubs. Um, this is an a interesting study, and I was just sent it uh, this spring, and I, I forget who it was. And, and I just, uh, very fascinating that churches that consider themselves as being conservative are not growing, they're still declining, but they're declining at a far less uh, precipitous, if I can use that, that word, the, the rate that they're going down is far less than uh, churches that describe themselves as being uh, liberal. Uh, I, and I will give you an example. Um, a, a church, a body that, that by their own admission would say that they would be uh, less conservative, more liberal than us. I really don't like using liberal and conservative because we have the political connotations, but I, I, don't, I don't know how else to do that. Uh, so if you uh, bear with me for this. Uh, ELCA is hemorrhaging members. Hemorrhaging members. And uh, the study, and, and ELCA just released a, a major study, and their study is that people view their church as really being superfluous to their life because the things that they get in their church, because there's really not as much stress, there is some, and some ELC churches are, are excellent. 
the one in Seymour. Um, I have gone there a couple of times to observe services. Very, very traditional. Mm, there are other ones. You would not recognize them, okay? Uh, but the, the, the conclusion of the paper was that because we have so uh, watered down Scripture, and they wouldn't use that word, uh, that, that it no longer matters to come to church or not because everything is just generally okay. Uh, their decline, by some estimates, has been in the, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, 30%. So it's just conservative Christian churches declining slightly. So I think, uh, I think that's interesting. The other interesting thing that they came up with, this is from the study from the ELC, which is very helpful. Churches that follow traditional worship tend to be stronger than churches that have gone to purely contemporary just to, I, I'm not saying anything about that. Uh, it's not my study. But it's interesting coming that uh, traditional services are holding a, a worship attendance where uh, purely contemporary styles are, are losing. Whatever, you do whatever you want with that. Okay, uh, when did we die to sin? At your baptism. For most of you. Any of you come to faith before... Um, at, before your baptism. In other words, you, um, you were not baptized as a child, but you, you heard the word of God, and that was the thing that brought you into to, uh, faith. Okay, Sandy, yep. Okay, there you'll be an example. Uh, the, uh, God has a, they're called means of grace. Good way of looking at it, I think, is, um, yeah, let me see, uh, what saves you? Ultimately, it's Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection. Uh, that, think of that as being like the electricity that goes around the building. You have to find a way to get that electricity into the, we'll use the light. Uh, don't look into the light if you've had cataract surgery because it will hurt really bad. Uh, so what happens? You have this power, it goes around and around and around, but it's got to get to the light. It gets through the light through the cord. What is the cord? That is faith. So when we talk about faith saving you, faith is the cord that taps into Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, here's the, the last little part of it. I don't want to poke in here. Uh, think of it like an outlet. I don't have my, my laser pointers. We're broken. Uh, anyway, you have an outlet. It doesn't matter whether I put the, um, the cord in this socket or I put it in this socket. Mary, each one is going to work, correct? Yeah. <laughs> Mary just nod, just like the vicar. Just yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whether you came to faith through baptism, whether you came to faith when you first heard the word and believed that Jesus was your Savior, it, it doesn't matter. God's given us two ways of doing that. Uh, Paul's talking about baptism here. Uh, and what does that mean practically? Sin no longer controls you. That's his point. Paul says that we can no longer live in it. We can live in it. How can we live in it, sin, any longer? Uh, what kind of sin is he talking about here? How can we live in sin? Don't, don't we, in some sense, live in sin? How many of you are, are going to sin today? Some of those hands are raised really high. <laughs> I, I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, who is not going to sin today? Well, I, I probably will. I'm not, I don't have any plans. Uh, <laughs> but, but is that going to happen? So, so what does he mean when he says, how can we go on living in sin any longer? Willful, willful sin. Yep, willful. Three words describe unrepentant sin. I won't tell you because it's in next week's sermon. I think it, it's in next week's sermon. Yep. Do you know which three words those are? You don't have to tell us. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Unrepentant sin. Uh, unrepentant sin, these, these are the sins I'm no longer fighting against. This is who I am. I'm, I'm celebrating my freedom. Uh, how do we share in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Oh, I thought this is an interesting idea. We've been united, that little word united. Flip the page. United really means to be grafted into something. I, I never knew that. You understand, you know, what grafted is like a tree? You know, where you graft something onto something else. 
I just thought that that was just a really interesting word, and I don't know why I never noticed it till I was doing my study for this. That means that uh, Jesus is that root, although, huh, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Huh, I hadn't thought about that before. You're grafted into Jesus. You're, you're the, the, you know, the little, um, Krista, you just went to plant school. What do you call that? Yeah, branch. Like a little tiny slip. What? Stem. We'll go with stem. Yeah. Twig. I was, I was hoping for something more, you know, technical, but <laughs> since we didn't run through the coaching of this episode, uh, I, will, I will give you a flyer on that one. Yeah, you take that little slip, and what do you do? You, you graft it into it. Where's the life coming from? The life comes from the root, from the, the stump. You, Christian, have been grafted into Christ. Where, oh, just think of all of the power that you get. You have the power that comes from being connected to Christ. All right, uh, take a minute or two here. I want you to think about those three things. How do you, how does a Christian share in Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection? Uh, take about a minute here. I'm going to pause. All right, what did you come up with? How, how does a believer share in Jesus' death? Anybody? How do you share in Jesus' death? Please, Ken. Exactly right. You're putting to death, in fact, my notes say put to death our, our old Adam, our, our sinful nature. Uh, I share Jesus' death, and in another sense, I, I share his death because I have now died to the law. That, that's part of, of St. Paul's point. Uh, what about his burial? How, do you, how, how does burial work with baptism? Now, here's, a, here's something I think that the... Um, uh, people back then would understand a little bit better than we do today because of our baptismal practices. How did the people used to be baptized? Yeah, immersion. So, you know, when you think about it, we were buried with Christ. You know, for them, the baptism, it's not just like uh, when I, I baptized Aiden yesterday. It was, I baptized you, Aiden Thomas Blakesley, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then his little tiny face got all wrinkled and stuff like that. And it was like, what, maybe a teaspoon or so of water each time. Boy, if you're going to be immersed, I mean, you're going under, under the water. Uh, how is that a fitting picture? Uh, of what it means to, um, to be baptized into Jesus, to be buried with Jesus. Well, how much of you are baptized? Yeah, drowning the sin, yep. And it's total. It's, it's total. You're completely under. I, um, we don't immerse. We could immerse. Uh, I, I've never immersed anybody. I did have one request uh, a bunch of years ago, somebody wanted to get immersed. Uh, it was a prospect I was working with. And uh, they wanted to be immersed in Legend Lake. And I said, uh, well, why? You know, I said, well, I just, I like the picture. I like the picture of completely being underneath. I am com totally, totally immersed in God's love. Fine. I said, I said it's, it's November. Uh, 
And I said, when do you want to be? Well, do you want it now? And I'd have done it. I don't know when you, where you rent a wetsuit. Uh, and does it look like a gown? I don't know. Uh, and then, then I said, I, I'm pretty sure we're not going to do that anytime like January, February, March, April. Because in my mind, I'm thinking like, do they have a baptismal auger? Uh, you go to the ice and you, it's like a man-sized hole. And I said, well, when's it going to be warm enough? And he goes, well, June. And I said, we, we could wait because he's obviously a Christian. His reasons for being baptized, immersed were, were valid. I said, do you want to wait that long? And he said, no. And I said, okay. But if it had been June and he had asked me, would I have immersed him? Oh, absolutely. It's just a, it's just a, a, a wonderful picture we don't do it here. There's a practicality, you know, for us because you need a place then you can immerse. Uh, so there you have that. Uh, and then how do you say, is it share in his resurrection? You've been, you've died. You've been buried. What about that resurrection? I'm a new guy. You know what I know about you? You are a new man. You are a new woman. That's who you are. Every day, you're a new man or a new woman. Every day, you wake up and you are renewed because you have shared with Jesus' death and his burial, and now you join with his resurrection. You are struggling in your life with whatever, and you wake up tomorrow morning, and you are able to say, I meet brand new me. I just got, I got my lunch handed to me the last week because I have struggled and failed against sin over and over and over again. But you know what? I went to bed and I was a child of God and I was a son or daughter of grace and I wake up and you know what? Today, I'm the new man. I'm a new woman. I'm going back in there. And you're not going back in there by yourself. You're going back in there uh, grafted onto Jesus Christ. It is a beautiful, beautiful picture. Maybe tomorrow. We're Lutherans, so we're not legalistic. But if I were, a good way to wake up in the morning is to say, through Jesus' death and resurrection, I am a new fill-in-the-blank. I'm a new Leon. Every morning I wake up. Oh, that's, a good, that's good news. All right, um, verse 8. Uh, we'll drop down there. Um, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live in him. Uh, what type of life is Paul referring to in this verse? You can also check number uh, verse 10. It gives a little bit more enlightenment. Yeah, new life. You're alive. Take a look at the opening notes. I contrasted two things, justification and sanctification. sanctification. That's the new life. Sanctification, that's your new life. Okay, how, how am I now going to put this justification into practice? Verse 11, he talks about being made alive to God. Uh, somebody want to read verse 11 for me? I'll take, go ahead, Dick. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be alive to God? There's really two senses this is true. You are alive to him. Jamie, that's some serious eye contact back there. Okay. <laughs> Jamie, did you remember that from FEL? Because I always used to tell, I always used to tell students, I said, D you know what? Just come out and say, I got nothing. You know, if I call on you and you just don't know, I said, the other thing is, like, don't make really long eye contact with me because I'm thinking you know what you're talking about. Uh, so what you do, if you give me the quick eye contact and then you look down, then I was like, okay, I will never embarrass you. But Jamie, that was so long. But it was such a great recovery when you go, I got nothing. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, what does it mean to be alive to God? In what sense are you alive, please? Yeah. You are alive. What happens while you are alive? You, you are growing. That is part and parcel about what we do. You are going to grow only through the word, though, and the sacraments. That's how you grow. That's the source of power. Um, another way that we are alive. Yes, there is a refusal to let sin dominate. Now remember, we're going to go back to verse 1 here. What was, what was Paul already anticipating? The charge like, hey, great, Paul, this is awesome. And now you're telling people you can just, hey, sin all you want because if you want more grace, then all you have to do is sin more. Is it true? Yes, of course it's true. The more you sin, the more grace you get. That's why St. Paul launches into this, says, that's a dumb argument. Uh, it's a reduction, the, the technical term is that it's a reduction to absurdity. That's what it's used for. Uh, and so he says, yeah, but you're alive, you're different, please. Nope. And if you know, and if you start talking about sanctification early in this chapter, I, I really think that that God is defining precisely what justification is. We're justified because we were baptized, and because through baptism we receive a new life in Christ, that we're grafted into Christ as it says in Romans eleven. And that's where I think like Pentecostals and Baptists, anyone that considers it theology. They're big on like overcoming sin. Mm -hmm. But then they get to the middle of chapter seven in Romans and it's like, well, they don't really know how to to, to like combine that with being dead to sin. Because we can't, you know, we're, we're dead to sin because of what Jesus did, not because of what we did. Yep. And that idea, and you're right, about about sharing in his death and burial and resurrection. Uh, I had a uh, a grade school friend in Milwaukee and and his mom was Pentecostal and uh uh, he told me that his, his mom had not sinned for like three years. And, and he was convinced. I mean, he just said, he goes, he goes, no. And I remember where we had the conversation. And you know, the thing I remember right now is he had a really big afro. This is not the most important thing I want you to take away. But Phil Owens had a huge, this is like the 70s, and afros were just big. Uh, and, and Phil told me, he goes, no, my mom has not sinned for like three years. But Pentecostal in that background of this is what I do. And, and as we said last week when we started, why does Paul spend five chapters talking about justification before he even begins to mention sanctification precisely so there isn't that confusion? Um, 12 and 13, it says, uh, it goes on to say, Dick, would you read those two for me? Jamie. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Upon further review. Jamie. 
Jamie, that's really good. Can you write that down? Yeah, don't you have notes? <laughs> Jamie, write that down because I'm going to wait till everybody forgets and then I'm going to use that in a sermon. <laughs> yeah. Huh. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, you are. Dead, you're not moving. You're dead. If you've seen a dead person, one of the things I can tell you, they're not moving. Okay? You're, you're alive. One of the things that happens, you're, you're moving. Yeah, nice. Yep, nice. Uh, uh, side light on, and just into language, one of the things that, I, again, I hadn't really noticed going through this, but over and over and over again uh, in these verses, uh, in these chapters, there's always this military idea. Uh, you see verse 12, reign, sin is regarded as a ruler who demands the military service of its subjects. I, I guess maybe the, the idea I would use today is that, you know, uh, this is the, the, the ruler who comes in there and, and you're just drafted. You have no choice. The military ruler comes in there and says, you're going to war. So do not let sin reign. This is the demand of that ruler who's talking about military service. Later on, he's going to pay those people who are working for him and he's going to pay the military wages. So the, 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 the background of this whole chapter is very militant and it's very military, uh, which really I think makes, and this is the beauty of the Holy Spirit, I think it works so well because it flows into chapter 7 in chapter 7, you have that idea of uh, this war that's going on. The good I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, that I keep on doing. And we've often talked about that is the civil war that is in Christians. Every one of us has it. It's like, that looks like a lot of fun, but it's wrong. It's going to be a lot of fun. Doesn't change that it's wrong. I want to do it. Well, that's, uh, that's my day, and uh, more than likely it is yours. What won't Christians allow? Sin to control us, to reign in us. We are going to fight. You and I are going to lose. That's why God gives us the sacrament. Why do you think that we offer the sacrament? I think 30 times a year. I, I, I tried to, to, to go up there. We have it here about 30 times a year. Um, uh, my home church, we had it every week. Early service one, late, oh, we only had services on Sunday. Um, so early service, 745 one week, and then 1015 the next. So it just flip-flopped. Um, number two, uh, we won't let sin be our motivation. And it was somebody, I, somebody over here last week talked about that, about how you can, you can kind of, seem like you're doing the right thing, but you're really not doing it for the right reason. I mean, it looks good on the outside, but uh, the, the Pharisees were very good at that. You know, it's like, I'm doing the right thing, but, but it's like, I'm going to pray on the street corner so that everybody can see me. Uh, sin is not our motivation. Uh, number last one, we're not going to offer the parts of our body for sin. This would have been the part where he was addressing specifically the Gentiles. Remember, those of you who were here two years ago, we talked about those two groups we viewed last week. Gentiles, coarse sins. Those are the sins of uh, very coarse sexual sins. Uh, drinking, debauchery, uh, that kind of thing. This is where he's addressing. So you look and he goes, hey, you know what? Jews didn't have a problem with that. A great problem, or not dominant. They, they had another problem that was work righteousness. Uh, verse 13, what will Christians do with their body? Well, you take a look at verse 13. What are you going to be doing with your body? Yeah. I'm, you, what are you offering? You're, you're offering your, your money. You are offering your time. You are also offering your body. God it is yours. It is all yours. I am yours head to toe. Take it all. That's a very powerful, powerful passage. Verse 14, then we're done. Uh, it says that we live under grace. 
What does it mean to live under grace? Sin no longer controls. I am living under grace. Apart from grace, sin has absolute dominance. But I've, I've died to sin. I've died to sin as the Holy Spirit has brought me to faith through the means of grace, either word or sacrament. Okay, next week uh, we'll pick this up. Pastor Diesler will pick this up. Um, if you could read through the rest of the chapter then. Uh, and then maybe if I could just have you do a, a little thinking. The top of the next page. What, if sin offers us no benefits, why, why do we keep sinning? The easy thing is that we're weak. Y yeah, I, I get that. But there's also part of us that wants to sin. What is it that we... What is the perceived good that comes from sin? Okay, we close with the uh, benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. Amen. Lord's blessings. We'll see you in a minute or so.